So again, <laughs> write it on your forehead. <laughs> Science through computing is at best as credible as the software that produces it. So we covered many topics uh, from designing, uh, collaborative software development, refactoring your software, packaging, testing, testing, reproducibility. And uh, there are many more. <laughs> we couldn't get through all of them. We only have so much time in a day. Um, uh, continuous integration, all sorts of in issue tracking. If you have any questions on those, we can even talk a little bit about those. Um, there are other topics that are important. Um, we have, we just don't have all the time. Uh, we didn't, we do do a full day tutorial and we had to kind of cut it down somewhat. But there, even with that, we could go on for a week probably on some of these things. Um, but you're a researcher and you can't afford to spend all your time on software engineering. Uh, your employer might not want you to. You have other things you have to get done. So what do I do? Well, again, uh, David went through this. David Bernholt went through this on the PSIP process, which is um, take some part of it, see if you can um, pick a process that would help you. You may spend a little bit of extra time on it, but it would help your um, time cost go down. So pick one, work on that. And then uh, as you get better at that, maybe you can pick another. Um, again, we have the rate your project assessment tool, take your all your team members to go through. It doesn't take very long. You could maybe see a common pain point that you, you know you could work on pretty quickly. Um, and then that card catalog has examples. You might even go through there and, and pick something that you know would help, um, uh, that a process that might help you. Or if you have one, you can go through there and find what someone else did that was beneficial to them. So again, um, work on that. And then when you do get something done, celebrate it and go on and do another. Uh, we have the uh, Better Scientific Software site that has a lot of resources. And I'm sure that some of you have some resources that you think would uh, be good on there. It's a community site. We'd like to see uh, contributions to it. So if you have ideas, you can um, jot them down. Or if you come across some tool that helps you or some process that helps you, uh, we can put that on that site too. <coughs> And I think that's about it. If you, um, we do have, you can write to us at this uh, um, site here, or email. And uh, again, uh, all of the resources are on the tutorial site um, and there's past tutorials on there. Um, and then we have the ideas productivity site. Uh, we have an announcement. Um, and the monthly digest, if you'd just like to see what the new things are that are highlighted on, at the uh, Better Scientific Software site and an RSS feed. So if you have questions, let me put that one back up because if anybody wants to jot it down, but it is on that uh, bsswtutorial.github.io. All these sites are on there. So if anybody has any questions for anything we talked about today. Any <laughs> it is that time of day. <laughs> um, so I'd also appreciate the feedback. So we had a, a comment early on that we um, aren't talking so much about the experimental and observational types of applications and things like that. Um, and there's there's certainly other things about our tutorials that uh, could be improved. So uh, we hope that you uh, got something out of this, but we'd also very much appreciate your feedback on how we can improve things, topics that you think we should be talking about. Um, you know, sometimes we have a material we didn't present, but um, but sometimes there's new things that we haven't really thought about or developed content for yet. Um, so all that kind of stuff, I think, is fair game. Um, you know, how we can, if, if you've gotten through some of this and you have thoughts already on how we can do a better job of incorporating experimental and observational 
scientific work into this. Um, we would welcome that kind of thing too. We're happy to talk with you offline. So uh, anything goes at this point. And I think we have plenty of time um, because we're growing, I think we're growing into a great. So would you, would you like to repeat that for online? <laughs> I was hoping the mic would pick that up. Uh, I don't think so. Nah. Okay, so um, I'll let David I'll, yeah. <laughs> So sorry for, for folks online. Um, we're interested in feedback, feedback of all kinds. Um, so in addition to questions, what could we improve about the tutorials, topics that you think we uh, missed talking about, things like that. And we're happy to have that conversation with you now or offline in whatever format is useful to you. So thank you. Please. Find us how we book one of these tutorials for you to come tell our scientists. Um, so there's um, an email address there that you can reach us at and um, we can uh, try to figure out uh, a time and place and topics and things like that. Um, just to, uh, so we do these at conferences. If you happen to be at ISC in Hamburg next month, uh, we're doing a half day tutorial there um, and we're going to be putting in a proposal to supercomputing. Uh, so there's a, those are a couple of uh, likely options at least coming up, but we can also do um, for particular projects or groups or things like that. I was a couple weeks ago at the um, Laboratory for Laser Energetics at Rochester and gave them sort of a short one hour mini tutorial. Um, so there's lots of different ways we could do this and we're happy to just reach out to us at this email and uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. That comes in a variety of links and topics from one hour to multiple We could days. spend days oh. if you wanted. Um, <laughs> depends on your stamina. <laughs> I have a question for the last two speakers, and it's about testing. Um, so you introduced a lot of great strategies for increasing test coverage. And um, my concern is, maybe this was already um, covered in your discussion, but is there any notion at all that too much testing could actually be a bad thing? Um, when we're dealing with all these different special cases of both successes and failures, when we're trying to, um, prepare input data and compare very, very complex um, data structures that we expect as a result, um, our testing code can become immensely complicated. So I'm wondering, um, is there a point at which your assertions are good enough and you shouldn't move on? Or should I continue to view this as a monotonic uh, relationship such that every, like, all, more, all the more testing code you introduce is always a good thing? Yeah, so there, there's also this trade-off between testing and, and you know, release productivity. So there is such a thing as too much testing. And the way that you can tell that you're spending too much time on testing is that you're not able to make progress on your actual um, you know, goals and deliverables. So you have to have this balanced view where you're, you're testing enough so that you're sure that what you're releasing is what you say it is. Um, but you also don't want to spend time developing tests, which are just because I want to increase the code coverage metric or because I want to test this, this piece of code, which I may use. Just like when you develop features, you, you develop features that add value. Um, tests add value to your code because you have confidence that you, what you're releasing is what you say it is, and you're not going to have to go back and fix those bugs. And it also allows you to check things as you add code. So. Um, the best time to add a test is, you know, when you start working with a new feature, um, because in that case, you have the ability to test at an easy level. Um, and once you have kind of a very complicated software stack, um, it may be, you know, getting away from you and difficult to put tests in there. Um, so it's, it, there's that constant trade-off between testing and productivity. Can I add something to that? Um, Okay, so um, 
I think there's a really useful backup strategy, which David talked about, which is regression tests. So you have a set of tests and it may not be 100% complete. It may not test every possible input or whatever, um, but you need to move ahead. Then somebody comes along and finds um, a bug and you diagnose it and you figure out the problem and you fix it and you add that to your test suite. And then not only can that um, bug not creep back in, but you're also expanding your tests based on the problems that have been experienced by actual users. So it's kind of, it's, it's a kind of a guided test uh, enhancement kind of strategy. And that may also, depending on that, uh, the nature of the bug, that may lead you to think about a few other tests to to sprinkle in there that are you know related to that to help improve you know that space or something else that might occur to you so it doesn't you know just don't necessarily have to do it all at once but um be ready to respond when they when new bugs do crop up and i have some more specific comments on data structures uh, i'm a big believer in having complicated data structures because they take away from the complication of your code um, but at the same time, you need to have frameworks and uh, conventions that allow those data structures to be uh, composable, testable, modular. Uh, YAML has been really amazing. There are toolkits that work with YAML structured data and can verify it. Um, there's JSON schemas, which were kind of the, the earlier tools, but the, and YAML and JSON are pretty much um, different formats that give you the same basic set of functionality. Um, but then there's also something called Pydantic for Python, which is a really good design principle to use for explaining the types that should go inside of your code. Um, and, and having kind of verifications at different levels of those data structures is important. Um, and I could go on for a little bit also about the security flaws that can creep in if you don't have very well-defined data structures. But suffice it to say, verifying your data structures is a great idea. Um, just, uh, I think one thing that should be emphasized is when you are coming up with tests, they should also adhere to the same software engineering principles that you're trying to apply to your code. For instance, I did have just the other week, I actually just deleted a whole testing directory because it was hard coded all the past, like had hard coded variable names. And so it was failing tests just because I refactored the code to be better. And it wasn't, and it was like, obviously the better way to do it would have been to spend the time to update the tests, but that wasn't on, it was just basically failing and non-operable for months. And I, this is also another thing that no one noticed. And so it showed that that testing had become orphaned. And so there is, you need to kind of still be applying to the same principles. Like don't have hard coded variables and nameless names in your testing structures. Cause then when you just change a nameless name and it fails. So uh, just things like that, is, I think it's worth considering. And also to actually look at the output from your tests, <laughs> see, yeah, see if they're all failing for a month or so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. One of the issues I've sort of run into with testing isn't testing per se, but more error handling in the sense of if I, you know, folks will give me code and it'll have a test for it and it'll say hundred percent code coverage, but there's no error handling inside. So it's just, you know, yeah, they only give it basically the success thing and never give it a failure. So how do you kind of, how do you emphasize not just testing, but also that, you know, um, you also want to implement error handling for weird situations, uh, but at the same time, you also don't want to overkill it because it's impossible to think of every possible thing that someone could throw at uh, at a function or a subroutine or whatever. So I guess how do you? I guess, I'm trying to think of the sorry, I was trying I was debating to come up here because I couldn't quite formulate my word for my question. But essentially, how do you how do you emphasize that you need error? error handling as well as just you know testing the code that's supposed to work does that make sense are these errors that are 
that are supposed to be handled by users of your code or errors that are supposed to be somehow cleaned up before the users see them? Oh, it could be both. I mean, so the one example I'm thinking of is, is more on the user side. So you imagine they would send in a name list and we would parse it. Uh, and, you know, there'd be, you can imagine like, oh, they threw in, it's supposed to be a string, but they threw in, you know, numbers or, or special characters or whatever. And so, uh, so you want it to, you want an error handler to say like, hey, this is a question mark and I'm looking for a letter. But, uh, uh, um, well, the problem is, I guess the test that came with it didn't catch that because it was just saying like, oh, did a string pass in and it was successful, so we're done. Uh, um, yeah, and then I guess there's internal ones as well. But I've, those are almost, yeah, I guess I'm actually, it seems like they might be a little harder because hopefully it would have been cleaned up before it got to the internal. Thing. Maybe not, I don't know. Yeah, that's the. So are you also asking about, for example, where people are using other libraries, say MPI, and they're not they're um, not checking the return codes from the, those calls or things like that? Is that yeah, kind yeah, of that's thing? another but, example. Yeah, because they'll they'll do they'll run a test and if it's successful, but then yeah, you never. Uh, it's just because they're not checking for it, or it'll die horribly if it's a really bad. Yeah, so from a from a security perspective, you want to reject all input that is invalid. Um, there's a little bit of a of a kind of there's a there's a maturity process to that though. You can have um, kind of an error handling that's I've detected an error for that that's kind of the simplest entry level, and the, you know at the at the very high levels, you might be able to provide some diagnosis and and resolution and recovery from the errors. Um, but just as kind of the base level that you should be targeting, you should know um, on every code that has a potential input that you can't control um, whether it is an error. Uh, yeah, I would add another thing to think about, especially with library calls and things like that would be, um, what are the potential consequences if the error goes unhandled, right? So if you um, think about whether you're catching errors or just letting them fall through, um, is it, you know, what what's going to be exposed to the user if that thing fails, and um, are they are they going to get an error message that will allow them to do something about it, or um, is it just going to be some mysterious thing that turns the user off or says, ah, this software is crap or or whatever, right? And um, so these are so yeah, I understand the pain of testing all the return codes and, and you know trying to do something sensible about them. So you might triage by saying, well, what, what are the consequences if this fails and how would users be expected to deal with it or should they be expected to deal with it and things like that. Maybe use ideas like that to help triage. And the same, I think the same could go for inputs and, and things like that, right? What's the potential danger or, or um, dissatisfaction from the users. <laughs> and also putting in checks when your code has gotten into a state that you didn't expect. You should immediately you know, quit and say why you quit. Because otherwise you, you won't be able to fix it. I think that's true, especially the development cycle. Like don't forget about the search. It takes a lot of time to think about all the ways the user might be getting tricked. And it's pretty easy to think of the key in and before it starts with the key first. Yeah, it may not present the user immediately, and you didn't put a question mark in the middle of the screen. But the developer will look at it and say, Any other questions? That let's thank our instructors one last time. <laughs>